Um, good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming this evening and sharing your evening with us. Just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we are going to record this and we're going to post it to the pre-medical social media. So adjust your cameras if you want them off, however you best, however you feel you need today. Um, we will have a question answer portion after Dr. Lincoln speaks. You can either raise your hand to ask a question or if you want to remain off recording, uh, you can submit your question via chat and Mr. Tickner or I will uh, pose that for you. Um, with those details being covered, I think we should probably get started. So this is the Washington College Pre-Health Profession Program uh, guest lecture tonight. This is Dr. For, Dr. Jennifer Lincoln. She's a 2003 alum of the college. Dr. Lincoln is an OB hospitalist, a lactation consultant, and a medical writer in Portland, Oregon. You might have seen her work on various media outlets, including the Today Show, Good Morning America, BuzzFeed, Parents, Dot com bustle pop sugar there are so many or if you're like me you went and stalked her instagram because we all know we've done that a time or two um, it's fantastic i hope you have seen her instagram other people have been telling me about her youtube channel check that out um, dr lincoln graduated summa cum laude in biology at the college in 2003 she attended tulane university school of medicine and completed her residency at the oregon health and science university She's a member of the board of directors for the Society of OBGYN Hospitalists and the Northwest Mother's Milk Bank. Uh, this lecture is one in a two-part series. So tonight, Dr. Lincoln is going to be addressing what she wished she knew as a pre-med. And on November 12th, she's going to be discussing what it's like to be a doctor. Um, so I hope you can join us for that one, too. But I think that is all of my pre-knowledge that you need on this. So with that, I will let you take it away. Thank you so much, Libby, and thank you guys so much for having me tonight. Um, super excited to be here. I feel like this is this great reunion, um, just to see some friendly faces and some new faces. Um, but before I start, I just want to say that I'm just so sorry that you guys are having the year that you are, and I fully recognize that this is not the college year that you were hoping for, nor was last year. Um, but it is temporary and it will get better. Um, and things like these opportunities open up, and so I'm hoping that we can try to take some good with the bad, but I don't, I do not want to at all discredit how much extra work and stress this is probably putting on you guys. So I feel for you. Um, and before I get started, so I thought I would just give a couple tips on what I wish I knew as a pre-med. And then I really just want to answer your question. So I'm not going to take up the whole time talking. Um, but before I start, um, it just, God, you realize it sounds so, you sound so old when you're like, you're graduated in 2003, which to me, that was like 10 years ago. And it's, it's not. So, um, it will go by quickly. Don't, you don't think so when you're sitting there and you're just trying to get into med school and people tell you that and you're like, yeah, but you're already there. So it's easy to say it really does. So enjoy the time that you can have there now. And I know it looks different. Um, I don't know if there's anybody here. Um, when, you know, when I was at WAC, um, I did study a lot, but that wasn't all I did. I remember of Zeta Tau Alpha. So I don't know if there's any Zetas here. <gasps> there is, yes. Um, that plaque better be up with my damn 4.0 GPA that I worked very hard for for a few semesters still in the chapter room. So that's your homework. I want some pictures of that. <laughs> um, I wrote for the Elm and I was an editor for that. Um, I did some research with Dr. Connaughton that involved a lot of fish. Um, and then after I worked with him for a summer, I went to University of Delaware College of Marine Studies and I worked with more smelly bacteria and fish and things. So, um, and yeah, I just, I miss it. It goes by super quickly. So. Um, being pre-med is not the only, hopefully the only identity that you have. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. And if you guys have questions and you want to interrupt me in the meantime while I'm chatting, do not hesitate. I like this is super casual. Um, so the first thing I want to hit on um, when you are pre-med is that there's no need to be perfect. And maybe people have told you this already before, but like, I remember people telling me that and I was like, yeah, that applies to other people. But me, I need to be perfect. I need to have perfect grades and do everything perfectly because otherwise I won't get into medical school. And that is simply not true. I, I'm not saying you shouldn't try really hard, but um, your grades are, a, you know, one aspect of who you are. And I work with, and I've known many physicians who had terrible GPAs. For example, my husband, whose pre-med advisor told him he would never be a physician. Um, and I think he's smarter than me. And he, you know, turned his grades around. And that is but one aspect of you. And sometimes you're not a good test taker or, you know, you're just, you've got that one professor not anybody here, but you work really hard and they still give you a crappy grade. And I'm not gonna name the name of somebody in the English department who I still will take to the grave, but whatever. Um, you don't have to be perfect. Um, 
obviously you need to do your best. Um, but like, for example, let's talk about the MCAT. I did terribly on it. Like I bombed it. Like I did so bad that I don't even remember the score and it's not because I don't want to share it with you. It's because I truly, I probably blocked. That's probably if I went to go see a psychiatrist, that number would come out again. But I remember I got it. I was actually at the College of Marine Studies doing research. It was like 2 a.m. because I had to be there to do like stupid bacterial counts in the middle of the night. And I logged on and I saw it and I immediately burst out into tears and I called my dad and I was like, that's it. I'm never going to be a doctor. And he was like, okay, like, why are you calling me in the middle of the night? And whatever. Um, but the point is, is that it was a terrible score. And it, that's just, you know, I, I don't think I studied the right way. And, you know, that was one aspect. And I remember talking to Dr. Reville about it. And I decided I was still going to apply because what's the worst thing that could happen, right? I could, you know, if I don't get in, just apply another year. And I applied to oodles of schools because I wanted to cast a broad net and I still got in. Um, so I don't want to think just, you know, just because you had a one bad test score or one bad grade or one bad MCAT score doesn't mean that you can't still be a physician. So don't let one little roadblock get in the way and don't let that idea of wanting to be perfect, not allow you to try new things. Um, so I majored in biology and I minored in chemistry. And then I also minored in English because for me, that was, I just, I love to write and I love to read. And that was my way of enjoying some things for me. So even though I wanted to do really well in my bio classes and chemistry and physics, which we're not going to talk about physics, but whatever, um, you know, English was fun for me. So I, I, I was able to work hard, but still have a little bit of fun. So that's important. The second thing is I want to address the fact, um, I know when I was a pre-med, part of me worried, you know, I'm going to a smaller school. I'm competing with people who are, you know, are at Hopkins and Harvard and Yale and Columbia. Why are they going to want to talk to me? And it's true, you are coming from a smaller school and so you do need to stand out. And, um, but I'll compare almost why I think it might be a good thing. So my husband, he has no idea I'm doing this talk tonight either or using him as a reference, but whatever. Um, you know, he went to Brown and he, you know, it's an enormous school, it's really smart people. And his pre-med advisor laughed at him when he said he wanted to be a doctor. He was like, yeah, you'll never be. Um, and so he took a year off and worked on things and took his MCAT. And thankfully, he did not listen to him. But the point is, is that when you are at a school like Washington College, where you've got small classes. So, um, so Dr. Knotten, so I took ichthyology with him my freshman year. And I got to do research as a freshman after the summer of my intern year. That does not happen at places like Harvard or Yale or Columbia or Hopkins, because there's just simply too many people, too many students. And you're not getting any of your intro classes from your um, professors. You're just getting it from the TAs. So you guys are already ahead of the game because your professors actually know who you are. And so they are going to be able to individually advise you. They know your name. They know your strengths. They can help tell you, you know what, I think maybe you should take this class. And when they write that letter of recommendation, trust me, you can tell when somebody knows who you are and somebody else is just like, they're a nice person. Here are their grades. Like you can just tell that they're trying to put together a letter of recommendation based on you know, a very superficial understanding of that person. So um, I don't want it, you to feel down because you feel like you're competing with all of these big name institutions or students from these places because at the end of the day, you are an individual and what WAC can give you can actually help you stand out. And to be honest, maybe there's only a handful of you guys applying to med school any given year, whereas from Brown, there might be a hundred. And I can tell you that when application committees see that, if they've already offered interviews to 50 people from Brown, like they're not going to give interviews to everybody. So it's good to be at a more unique setting. I personally think so. Um, but I know that was something I stressed out about a lot when I was applying, like, why are they going to want to talk to me? So um, name recognition isn't the only thing. Um, the third thing is, um, what should I talk about next? Oh, actively getting involved. So everybody wants to know, like, what do you have to do to get into medical school? Like, how much research do I have to do? How, what do my grades have to be? Do I, how many letter of recommendations do I need from a physician? Do I need to shadow? Blah, 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 blah. There's no one way to do it. And so if you can actively get involved, however that is, in some kind of medicine, I think there's two benefits here. And I think really the more important one is that you can figure out if you really want to do like this whole thing, because it's kind of a long path. <laughs> and to figure it out in the midst of med school and drop out or even in residency, which I've known some people to do, is less than ideal. Um, so it's really nice to figure that out ahead of time if this is really a road you want to go down. Because if you do want to be a doctor, that's awesome. But if you realize, you know, I want to go into healthcare, but medicine's not for me, or, you know, being a medical doctor, there's lots of other great paths, like um, being a physician assistant or a nurse or, you know, an occupational therapist. So there's lots of good pathways. And I don't want you to think you just have to do this, um, that being a, a physician is the only way to deliver healthcare. So 
I didn't do this at all. I like, don't be like me. I went and I was a candy striper. What is that hospital? Kent and Queen Anne Hospital. I carried jugs of urine around and I was the only one who was not a member of the AARP. Like these old ladies, like they gave me a whole little, I still have it. God, I should have busted it out. It's like this pink jacket with my name tag. And I sat there and like, I just was hoping they wouldn't die because they were so old next to me as we're volunteering together. And they'd like want me to resuscitate them because I didn't know what I was doing. I literally, that was my, that was my volunteering in medicine, <laughs> which is don't, don't be like me and just, you know, instead what I should have done is I should have like sought out a physician or, you know, somebody I could shadow or get into the OR with. And I think this is where I sound really old, but now you really have access to people via LinkedIn and other opportunities where you can really contact, you can figure out who's in your, um, you know, who's in Chestertown or who's where you guys are right now and say, who can I shadow? We even do this thing called virtual shadowing. I just signed up for this where um, you can like shadow us where you spend like an hour and a half with us and we go through cases. And so out of coronavirus comes many new innovations, which is awesome. But if you can somehow get into the OR or get into a doctor's office so that you can really see what it's like, and then you can form that relationship. Yes, that's another way to get a good letter of recommendation, but it's really good for you guys to see if this is a path that you want to take. Um, and sometimes it can be really nice to see what the end game is when you're in the midst of taking physics. Yes, I hate physics. Um, and be like, okay, this is what, this is why I need to do this. This is, I'm just going to keep going, you know, especially when you're studying for the MCAT, it's nice to have that dose of realism of why you're putting in the hours. Um, so if you can do that, um, I don't think I did that. I could have done, I could have been better at that. And I think I just got lucky and I ended up really loving medicine, but I think that that would have been a little more helpful. Um, you know what, I don't have this on my list, but this kind of backs onto it. Um, don't be a pre-med because your mom or your dad wants you to be a doctor. And hopefully you guys are at this point where you've realized that, but truly you will be miserable. Like you will be miserable if you're working 80 hours a week as a resident. It's Christmas Eve. You are, you know, delivering every baby on the floor and people are yelling at you because they're cranky and you haven't slept in three days if this isn't a job that you don't want. And I'm not saying that I love every moment of my job, but I love my job. Like every day that I go to work, I love my job. And I, I joke, you know, if I'm spending my Saturday night at 2 a.m. doing a C-section, that's a complete disaster of a medical case. I, if I didn't truly love why I was there, I would walk away. Um, and I would be so just not happy person. So if you want to go into medicine, make sure you're doing it for you. Don't do it because you think it's going to make good money or because your parents want you to, or because you think that's the only way to be involved in healthcare. Truly make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. And it's okay if you realize that it's not, um, because at the end of the day, it's better to figure that out sooner rather than later. And then if it is, then, you know, go for it. I, um, attended, I don't know if they still do it, the National Youth Leadership Forum, like high school students, I think they have that. And it was like a week conference in Boston. And I went and I um, heard from these Harvard medical students and they were all so miserable. And I was like, well, screw that, medicine sucks. And so I started Washington College. I was like, oh, I'll be a medical writer. And then I took microbiology and I was like, oh, I'm just kidding. Like, I totally wanna to be a doctor. And I realized that truly, that's why I wanted to do it. So just figure out along the way that you really wanna do it for the right reasons. Um, Let's see, what's my other one? Oh, you only need one acceptance. I wish I had known that as a pre-med. Um, you only need to get into one medical school because those people, when they graduate, they're called doctors. You only need one. You do not need to get accepted to 8 million places. Is it nice to have choice? Sure. Um, I only got into, so when I graduated, and this kind of goes into another, what I wish I'd known, um, or maybe I did know, but I want to make sure you guys know about having a backup plan. So I remember walking across that stage, really thrilled to be graduating, but kind of bummed out because I hadn't gotten into med school yet. I was waitlisted at two places. Um, I only interviewed at three places. I interviewed at Tulane, where I ended up going, Georgetown, and where they spent half the interview telling us how much money the school would be, and I was kind of, that was weird. Um, and then SUNY Downstate, and I was waitlisted there as well. And in the meantime, as a backup plan, I had applied to Tulane's Master's of Pharmacology because I figured, well, even if I don't get in this year, I can do something, those classes will go towards med school, I will just be super annoying and they'll see my face every day and then they'll wanna take me the next year. Um, and I got the, the phone call like three days later after graduation that I'd gotten in off the wait list and I was super jazzed. Um, and then that was it, I only got into one place. And I remember feeling like, you know, once you finally get into medical school and you go there, everybody thinks they're the one imposter who doesn't belong, that it was an accident that they let me in. and. Um, you know, other people were amazing and they'd gotten in everywhere and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, this is the only, only invite I got. So I'm going to take it. Um, and actually it ended up like, I'm thrilled and it was a wonderful place. That's where I met my husband. 
Um, you may have heard New Orleans the school because there's lots of ways to, you know, celebrate after tests. That is true. Um, so we had a really, you know, it was really fun. Anyway, the point is, is you only need one place, um, one acceptance. And if you don't, or if you are worried that you might not get in, have a backup plan. And I don't want you to think that you have to go straight through. That's another point I wanted to bring up. I think when I was doing this, I don't think the idea of the gap year had really materialized yet. I don't know. I feel like that became more of a thing. That would have been, maybe that would have been fun. I don't know. I'm glad I went straight through and I just did it because I probably would have just walked away and like sat on a beach for the rest of my life. But I think truly, if you intentionally take a gap year because that's what you want to do, um, using that year wisely, or if you just don't get in and you end up taking a gap year or two or three while you work on getting in, that is okay because that's amazing life experience and there's really no need, um, there's no one way, no one path. But if you wanna make a backup plan, there's some really great programs and I'm sure you guys have reviewed some of this. Um, I applied Drexel had one, it was like a, some, some like post back thing. Um, and I got in there and then I got into the Masters of Pharmacology at Tulane. And a lot of these programs are designed where it's a one year program. You are taking some of your classes along with the medical students. And then a lot of them get in that following year because you're a known quantity. You've already proven you can do the work. Um, and frankly, you get in and the next year you're like the TA for that class because you've already done that class as a, you know, the year before. So it was the first year you don't need to do that. Um, I remember we had a bunch of those people in my class and we loved having them around because they'd been there the year prior. They knew the ins and outs. They were the ones who would be our TAs in gross anatomy. Um, they could tell us what questions, you know, we should probably focus on. <laughs> um, so there's, there's no one path. So do not feel that you have to rush into medical school after college if that's not something that feels right for you. Maybe you want to work and save money. Um, maybe you, you know, you've got other family things you need to take care of or you're just not sure. Like, there's no need to rush right into it. I was the kind of person I just, I love school. I tell my fourth grader, he's like, really mom, you love school? It's like, oh, I wish I could still go back. Um, so I'm still thinking of additional degrees that I can get for fun um, just because I love being a student. Um, but you don't have to rush through it. So, um, so yeah, I think those are all of my I wish I knew, but I'm, I'm sure there's more stuff I wish I knew, but I feel like I had such good advisors and such a good team that I feel like I had a lot of my answers. Um, but I would love to stop blabbing right now and just answer any questions you guys have, which means you better have like one or two, otherwise it'd be awkward. Um, but I hope that was helpful. <laughs> and feel free Thank to- Thank you. I'm gonna, I was gonna say, Phil has the, I think you can see when people raise their hand, because I doubt I can see it. But if y'all have questions that you don't wanna ask yourself, you can put it in the chat and we'll pose them for you. Because mm -hmm. there's no way I answered everything you wanted. Do any of you guys have questions about um, how much it costs or debt? Is anybody worried about that? Or not, because the whole world is in debt right now and we're good with it. <laughs> I do have one that came in and yeah. it's, uh, what if you want to become a PA? Do you suggest taking the pre-med route and just applying for PA programs in grad school? Also, mm -hmm. what do you recommend majoring in? Oh, let me talk about the majoring one first. I actually know the answer to that. Um, I think you should major, and I'm so glad you brought that up because I don't know why I didn't hit on that. You should major in whatever you want, whatever interests you. So I majored in biology because I love biology and it's interesting. And I minored in chemistry truly because it was only like three more classes. I don't love chemistry, but it was helpful. Um, major in whatever you want as long as you hit your pre-med requisites. Um, do not major in biology because you think it's going to help you in medical school because I promise you what you major in. So like I remember I took biochem and that was helpful because my first year of medical school, we did biochem too. What we learned in biochem in college, we covered in a week in medical school. So the point is, is that, was it helpful? Sure, but I would have figured it out anyway. So don't feel like you need to do it to get a leg up. You will be taught what you need to know in medical school. You'll be taught more than you need to know because you can't possibly absorb all of it and you're not supposed to. Um, so quite frankly, if you don't want to major in the sciences, like that's awesome because this was the last time really that you'll be able to do, you know, major in philosophy, major, God, major in business because I suck at business and I really wish I'd gotten a business degree. Like I, I wish I could learn how to negotiate better. I wish I could understand finances. Like I wish I had done those sorts of things. Um, so if you want to major in something else, do it. It also makes you super interesting in an interview. 
if you, let's say you majored in philosophy and somebody's like, hey, how, you know, philosophy, tell me about that, right? Because people like me are interviewing you and I want to hear like, how is that going to help you as a physician? Or tell me about what you've learned. Like, it just makes you more interesting. Um, and in my medical school, we had such a diverse class of students. We had, I'm trying to remember in my class, we had an ex minor league baseball player. We had like a retired um, like officers from the Air Force and the Army. And then we had like boring people like me who just came out of college. But I remember thinking everybody else was so much cooler, like people who had founded nonprofits and all this other stuff that I was like, that's cool. I survived college. Like that was my claim to fame. Um, so don't feel like you have to major in the sciences. It's like when people come to me and they want to be an OBGYN and they say, what should I do in my rotations? And I'm like, well, do a couple to make sure, but then please do everything other than OBGYN because I will, we will teach you that in residency. Do emergency medicine, do the ICU, do the other stuff that's really fun that you'll never do again. Um, so yeah, and then when it comes to applying to PA school, so truly I'm not the expert in that. I don't know the, you know, the path for that. It's like that, nursing school, that kind of stuff. Um, I would say ask the advisors what they recommend the best, best path is because I imagine prerequisites might be a bit different. Um, and if there's one thing I can advise everybody to take, um, take some, I, I don't know what courses are offered, communications courses, cor courses in public health. Um, because it's so important how you practice medicine and how you treat people. Um, it's not just about the disease process, it's about explaining things to people because if people can't understand what you're saying, it doesn't matter how good of a doctor you are if they leave the office completely confused. Um, take courses like that. Um, audit courses, if you're worried that you wanna take a class but you can't, you know, you're like, oh, that person's such a hard grader and I don't want them to blow my GPA, audit it. It's still super fun. I remember taking, um, uh, what was his name? Archeology. span uh, I think he's still there, the professor. I can't remember his name. Um, but like, do I ever use archaeology in my day-to-day -day life? No, but it was super exciting and it just gave me a different appreciation for humanity. So be as diverse as you can in your course selection. But if you're like me and you want a perfect GPA, you can always audit or, you know, do that kind of thing or do something pass fail potentially. So, and I'm sorry, I'm not more helpful with the PA question. I just, I don't know that path as well. I think there might've been another is there a question here in the chat? Let's see. Oh, did you work while I went through med school? Um, no, except in the summer. So remember how I told you um, that National Youth Leadership Forum on Medicine conference that I went to as a high school student? Well, between my first, was it my first and second year? Yeah, between my first and second year, um, I was a counselor for that group because I was like, I am never I'm gonna make sure the kids who come through this program, you know, they had it in different cities and we had one in New Orleans and I wanted an excuse to stay in New Orleans over the summer, which was a huge mistake because it's very hot. Um, and it's not good for your hair in case you're worried um, if you frizz easily. But, um, and so I did that and I only worked because there was, there was too much. Um, I was too busy during the year. Um, so I saved a little bit of money that way. Um, I will touch on this because I imagine some of you are, are wondering, um, it's really expensive to go to medical school. God, it's expensive to go to Washington College now. <laughs> I was looking at tuition rates and I was like, sweet Jesus. Um, and then add on top of that, a, like a graduate program. Um, so I did it all completely on loans. I went to a private medical school on loans. Yes, I'm still paying on them. Um, but in some way, it kind of gave me the freedom because when you're six figures in debt, like it's okay to go out to a nice dinner on Valentine's Day. So, you know, like whatever, we're going to the French Quarter. Um, and in all honesty, I mean, you know, could, if you want to save money, yes, you can go to state schools. There's lots of programs you can apply to, scholarships where you work at federally qualified health centers afterwards. There's lots of ways to not go into as much debt as I did. Working during medical school in general, I don't know how you would do it and manage the coursework. And then once you get into your clinical years, that is your job. You're just not getting paid for it monetarily, but you are with education. Um, but you can, you know, potentially do stuff in the summers. But I think really you have to focus so much on learning. And I'm not worried about my debt. If there is one field that you can go into and know that it will pay off, it's medicine. You cannot say the same about taking out loans to go get a master's in business or even to law school because you can never guarantee an income in the way that you can as a physician because there's always jobs needed. It might not always be the exact job you want, but even in the midst of this pandemic, even when I got a 12 and a half percent pay cut, despite doing more work and doing more risky work, and that's a whole other situation, I knew that if I, if I had to, I could do moonlighting, I could do locums, I could make that. There's, the earning potential is always there. And if anything has shown in this pandemic where working in an essential position is worth it financially, 
you know, I, I just, just know that you will always be able to make your payments and there's ways to do it wisely. Like my husband drives a 2001 Honda Civic, which sounds like a go-kart. I mean, he needs a new car, but anyway. Um, but like, you know, we don't know, you're not going to go out and buy Mercedes and go crazy and whatever. Um, I spend my money on good coffee and that's worth it to me. Um, but there's ways to, yeah, we're in debt, but we're totally fine. And there's ways to be smart about it. And then you marry somebody who understands finances and they refinance when the interest rates are low and, and he has me sign paperwork. I'm like, sure, that sounds good. I mean, who knows? Maybe he's taking my money and I don't know, but I think we're okay. Um, <laughs> um, I'm all about like, you know, being a, I'm a woman physician. I'm like, I don't know how to access my paycheck. So don't be like me. Take a goddamn business class. <laughs> don't be like me. <laughs> Mr. Techner is like, never again. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, I've known people who've done some crazy stuff in med school, um, like donating, donating, selling their plasma, um, signing up for research studies. I feel like you should probably be a little, you should really read the fine print there. Um, but no, I mean, you can totally do it. Um, it's totally, I think it's worth it. So, and that's why it's important before you go in this, because if you, once you're on the hook, if you decide that you don't want to practice medicine, um, and you have that debt, like, you know. It, that's a lot to pay back if you do not complete the training and, you know, um, and practice. So, yeah. And I'm not sure, Phil, if you can see other questions or not. Um, I haven't seen any more come in. Um, yeah. I did realize that apparently at one point when my account was moved over, um, the ability to hand raise, I think, was turned off from my meetings. And I just now right. realized that. Um, so I don't know if people do want to, you know, say their questions aloud, they could probably just jump in, but I see another, oh, yeah. there's actually another question now asking about the difference between MD and DO. Oh yeah. So yeah, I didn't see that. So thank you. If you see them, just throw them in. Um, there is no difference at the end of the day. There's no difference between an MD and a DO. And I don't know if you guys have been looking online and seeing kind of the whole controversy. Well, not online. Um, we're not going to get political, but you may have heard recently that some people say that DOs are not good physicians um, or, or not trained physicians. And in the United States, DOs and MDs have the exact same privileges. You can be, you can work in any field, in any specialty and be an MD or a DO. The difference is truly, you know, different schools, different applications, and um, DOs get additional training in osteopathic manipulation. Um, that's it. And so, in, now in the real world, um, I have heard where sometimes DOs may not be as accepted in terms of certain specialties. They may not get residency spots. Um, they may not be given jobs because people think a DO is not as good as an MD. I think that tide is turning and I think it's a bunch of BS and I work with MDs and DOs all the time and nobody cares. Um, as to whether or not you want to apply to MD or DO schools, I think it's important to, you know, that's why it's great to have pre-med advisors who know who you are and, and can make that discussion with you. Um, because you might, you know, what enters into the conversation is, do I apply to just MD, MD and DO, MD, DO and international, like Caribbean medical schools or otherwise. And I think it, there's definitely pluses and minuses to each. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you can be, you can go into any specialty. Um, I'm not aware of any salary differences or anything like that. We have different um, board exams um, in medical school. And then once you are in your residency training, it's the exact same. Like, so there's MD and DO OBGYNs, and we take the same written and oral boards. Um, and it doesn't matter what degree you have, so. I don't know if there's any others. You guys are too quiet. <laughs> I'm surprised my kids are upstairs and I ordered them not to come down unless the house was on fire, so. I don't know. They're too quiet too, which is very suspect. <laughs> um, is there a hierarchical, hi, that's a hard word, hierarchical mentality towards medical schools in post-graduation? Do you mean, James, do you mean like, um, like in residency or hierarchy with it? Like when you're in medical school, I should to make sure I answer the question to what you, what you mean there. Um, and while you're clarifying, I will let you know. Yeah, I mean, a hierarchy exists. Um, I think appropriately. I think that it's important to, you know, there's expectations in the first, second, third, fourth year. There's expectations from your intern year as a resident up to the chief resident. Um, 
when you guys are applying and interviewing at medical schools, I think it's really important to feel out the vibe um, because schools are different and how students are treated is very different. Um, and I know, and then with residency, it's the same exact thing. And I remember interviewing at a certain East Coast program for residency and we were at m m which stands for morbidity and mortality. And that's where you discuss like, oh crap, that happened that week that shouldn't. In this case, is supposed to learn. Learners attendings can wisdom and you know you discuss interesting cases and challenging cases and I remember these attendings like demoralizing the residents and I looked around I was like do they know it's an interview day and like we're here and this is supposed to be their best face forward and needless to say I did not rank them in the residency match and where I ended up going um, Oregon Health and Science University um, it was a completely different feel and learning was so um, I mean there was still a hierarchy I'm I, I mean, we're not all kumbaya in the Pacific Northwest. I definitely got it handed to me quite a few times and appropriately so, um, but it was a different, um, what's the word, philosophy towards learning. And I, I think that in medical school, even since I was a medical student, I feel like it's getting better. Medical students, I mean, yeah, there's some scut work and there's some things that you feel like you shouldn't have to do, but um, you know, it's not as bad as it used to be. And in some ways, some of these things that you feel like you shouldn't have to do, there is good learning from it. Um, and we, I think we are in a different day and age where you can speak up now and it is not like 30 years ago where if you spoke up, you were trashed and you were thrown under the bus. I mean, now more appropriately, I think with lots of things, when you speak up, if there's something wrong, there's, there's a pathway to make sure that that person, if they're mistreating students, whether it's for sexism issues or racism issues or what have you, um, I think there's more of a no tolerance policy, appropriately so, um, which is nice. But I'm not sure if that's what you were asking about. Um, but yeah, I will say it was, it's very interesting to see medicine practice on the East Coast versus the West Coast. So I did my training on the West Coast and then I came and practiced for three years in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, and it was very different. <laughs> it was very different how, you know, um, I mean, again, I guess in the Pacific Northwest, you know, we're all hippy dippy and whatever, but um, it was, it was just different. It was interesting to see. And not that one was necessarily better than the other. Um, it was just very interesting. And I think, and I think if you can, you know, if you can travel, if you can do electives, if you can, when you are applying um, to medical schools, if you can um, stay over with the med students for a night, um, Here's how I'm such a loser and why I was too worried about grades. So I'm interviewing in New Orleans at Tulane for my med school interview. <laughs> and we went out one night and, you know, when you're on an interview and you go out, you still act appropriate and you don't, you know, you don't do stupid things. But then, so I stayed an extra night after my interview because the flights back, you know, they were too late or whatever. And they were like, hey, we'll take you out. We'll go down Bourbon Street. And I was like, I can't, you know, I've got an organic chemistry quiz. When I go back, like I have to stay in and study. And I stayed in and studied. And they still let me into this school because like, <laughs> they should have been like, she's such a loser. Like, no, um, I should have gone out. I should not have worried about one stupid quiz and I just should have gone out, but that's okay. When I hosted the students, I was like, you're not allowed to so we are going out. So, um, so yeah, and that's how I knew that was a good, I was like, oh man, I should go here. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, not that you can't always study for your quizzes. They're important. Dr. Reveal and Kanan are like, oh my God, she's telling the students to drink heavily and not study. <laughs> and this is water, not wine. So I promise I'm not doing that right now. But um, but yeah, no, there has to be a balance. There's a, um, oh, there's, I see, yeah. I'm sorry, there's a couple that came in privately as well. Oh yeah, please, yes. Um, why do Ameri some Americans go to medical schools in different countries? Mm -hmm. And then I guess somewhat related, does it really matter if you go to a highly esteemed school for medical school as opposed to in a lesser, well, it says unknown uh, yeah. In medical school. Yeah, um, so why do some people go to international schools? I think, um, and again, not being a pre-med advisor myself, I don't know all the ins and outs, but I would say um, it might be that some international schools are might be easier to get into than some of our US schools. And I don't wanna step on um, Dr. Reville or, or Libby here, because I don't know the ins and outs, but I know from people who've gone to international schools then applying to residency, um, like if you're trying to decide DO versus international, it's definitely easier from what I've seen in terms of matching to match as a United States school graduate versus an international school graduate, but ask them, they're the experts on that. Um, so I think that might be why. Um, and then the second question was, oh, like going to a lesser known medical school. So here's the thing, the person who graduates last in medical school is called a doctor, just like the person who graduates first and the person who 
goes to, you know, state school, whatever, versus Harvard Medical School are, are all called doctor. So that said, I'm not encouraging you to go to medical school and not study and be a, you know, because people will die if you don't. So you should do that. Um, and it's kind of important, but it, it could potentially affect um, residency matching. So what happens is once you decide what you want to do in medical school, then you do your residency, which is your specialized training. And that's a matching process where you apply, they decide if they want to interview you, you go interview, you make a rank list of where you want to go most to least. The residency programs make a rank list of who they want most to least. And then a magical computer makes this, in, you know, this match and the, it's supposed to err in the favor of the candidates. And so then you end up matching. So you don't really have a choice of where you go. Um, but, um, but that's a talk for another day. Um, so might you potentially, if you want to go into a highly competitive residency, like plastic surgery, neurosurgery, um, uh, there's a couple others, um, then maybe going to, sometimes going to certain programs matter more than others. But at the end of the day, I would say even that's not that big of a deal because it's how you do as a medical student. It's also, if you do away rotations, it's who you know in the field, not to say that like you have to know people, but if you know pretty early on, you want to do neurosurgery, you make contacts and you, you know, you rotate and you do research and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's, it, again, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because when you are actually um, treating patients, they don't ask you what place you graduated in and where you graduated from. I mean, some of the weird old men sometimes do, and that's why I'm an OBGYN, but, um, <laughs> but at the end, I mean, truly, like, that's not, it doesn't matter. You do well wherever you are, and it does not mean just because you went to Yale that you've got a better education than somebody who went somewhere else. I mean, I went to Tulane, and I spent part of my time at um, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston during Hurricane Katrina, and I did my, like, two of my core rotations, OBGYN and neurology, kind of as an add-on student they threw on because our, you know, like our med school had flooded and that kind of thing. Um, and I winged it and I made it work and it didn't matter. And, you know, I just, I don't think it matters necessarily. And I think I got a better education in some ways than somebody who went to maybe a more, you know, considered a more prestigious place because I got to do things that when you're in the big ivory tower, sometimes there's so many fellows and trainees and medical student doesn't get to do anything. When I was at Ben Taub General Hospital in Houston, Texas, where babies were like falling out in the hallways, I got to do it all because it was that kind of place. If I'd been at Harvard Medical School, um, again, not to bash Harvard, like, you know, places where there's 27 fellowships, you know, you're never going to get to do that interesting surgical case. So it's not always about the name. Sometimes it's better not to go to a super well-known place because you get to do more as a student. Um, so yeah. Um, and I see a question here. Is there anything specific you recommend to do to prepare for the academic transition between college and pre-med? I want you to have the best summer of your life before you go to medical school. For me, I worked at Starbucks because that was my life's dream was to be a Starbucks barista. And to this day, I walk in, I'm like, mm, that's wrong. That's not how you make that. But um, I just, I wanted to do that. Like, that's why, I'm, you know, who I am. I just wanted to work at a coffee shop and like hang out that summer and go to the beach. That's what, what you need to do is you need to go to the beach. You need to sleep really late. Sure, make some money and save it, but whatever. Um, don't study. Don't do anything because you will learn it in med school. And it's, you know, it's the last full summer of your whole life. So I would not want you to do anything educational during that time. <laughs> Just enjoy it. Watch a lot of movies, you know, do that kind of thing. Um, and, and all actual, like, we will like most med schools have like a two week orientation period where they're spending so much time orienting you. Um, and it's super fun and it's not that cheesy and it's, but it's, you know, they will teach you what you need to know. Um, don't, don't waste your time. <laughs> I don't know if you have any other ones, Phil, I can't see. Yep. There's one that came in. Um, yeah. what are some struggles that you faced during undergrad? And then, um, also you mentioned imposter syndrome. How did yeah. you overcome that? Yeah. Um, I'll start with the second one. So why do you think I've overcome it? Because I have not. <laughs> I mean, there's still every day I go to work and I was like, oh my God, they're letting me do this. Um, and not really, but yeah, if you don't have some, some semblance of humility when you're doing your work, when you have your hands inside a human's abdomen, when you are the one who is telling somebody that they have a disease that they will die from, when you are the one who delivers the baby who is not alive and you have to handle like, Every, there is oh there should always be a part of you that feels like am I the best person to do this and how can I 
be the best version of myself today to give this person the care that they deserve. So I think that you always have that imposter syndrome. Um, the difference is, is that you just learn that a degree of that is normal. It should never be paralyzing. Um, so like in medical school, when I said we all have imposter syndrome that first day, like acknowledging that and being, you know, and talking about it and understanding that you are worthy and you should be there and, you know, having that positive self-talk, like, you know, for me, when I'm in the middle of, um, you know, just last week, I had somebody who was 28 weeks pregnant, who had a hypertensive disease, her placenta was abrupting, her baby was crashing, and she needed an emergency C-section, I couldn't get my anesthesiologist to listen to me, um, I had no surgical assist, and, you know, in my mind, I'm like, well, this is not ideal, and I'm like, you know, and you, and you start to free, you're like, oh God. And then you just go and you, re and you go, I'm, I'm so well-trained. I'm the one, I can do this. And then you just do it. And then you realize that you do know what you're doing and, and, and things are okay. Just like when you're helping somebody else in that situation, um, you know, you're like, they're great. And I'm so glad that you, you just realize that your training puts you where you're supposed to be. So when you go into medical school, you might feel like, oh my God, I didn't go to some fancy name school. Like, why did they let me in? And then you realize you do know more biochem than the person next to you who happened to go to Columbia, like, because you do, because you're smart. Um, so it's just some positive self-talk and then surrounding yourself with the right people, I think. Um, there was a first part that I forgot. Yep. Uh, what are some struggles you face during oh. undergrad? Yeah, it's called physics. Physics. Um, physics, um, struggles. I mean, I would say for me, it was a struggle of... Um, a feeling like if I didn't have a 4.0 GPA that I would never get into medical school. Um, so when I graduated with not a 4.0 GPA, I was like, well, that's why nobody took me. I mean, other than the horrible MCAT, I would say the MCAT was the biggest struggle. Um, sophomore year for me was hard because I think that's when I took OCHEM and physics. And I remember I had four labs and I remember Dr. Reville was like, Jen, do you want to do this? And I was like, of course I do. Everything's fine. And by the weekend, I was like, everything is not fine. <laughs> But it was, I mean, it was. Um, there were some hard semesters where I remember feeling like I was drowning, but I asked for help. And that was the difference of going to a smaller school. So calculus, I suck at math. I suck so bad at it. That's why I'm not an anesthesiologist because I see them doing like the one to 10,000 dilutions. And I'm like, I would kill somebody because I would just do it wrong. That's why OB is great. Like there's like four doses of meds that we use and whatever. Um, <laughs> not really, but kind of. The answer is always 25 micrograms in OB. Um, and so, and so calculus was really hard for me, but I went to, I can't remember her name, but I remember it was during, um, like some building was being built and she was in a trailer and a little trailer and she had little flamingos outside. And every Wednesday, like I was there, I was like, hi, it's me again. I have no idea what's happening. So I asked for help and I was not shy about asking for help. I was not shy about going to um, office hours when I had no clue. Um, and I wasn't shy about one time when I got a grade in English and I felt I didn't deserve it. And I was like, I need, like, can we talk about this? Um, so yeah, asking for help is the key. Um, I think one thing I did do really well, and I think part of it, you know, I wasn't a sorority. I had friends who respected my need to study and never pressured me to feel like I, you know, I was missing out. I kept a good balance. I, and maybe that's why I ended up going to medical school in New Orleans, because you work hard, you play hard. Um, but I just feel like um, sometimes the pressure was really hard. Like that song, Under Pressure, I remember being in the Zeta chapter room at 3 a.m. studying for Dr. Munson's parasitology exam. And he was like, nobody ever gets an A in this class. And I got an A just to prove him wrong. Um, but I was like up at 3 a.m. like freaking out and like having to breathe into a paper bag because I had to know some stupid life cycle of a larva. And I remember that I was like, okay, I need to just stop and like take a breath and, you know, chill out. Um, and that's where having friends that, you know, could, could say, Jen, just stop it. Just come out with us. It's like, okay, I will. Um, but yeah, the pressure is real, but it's important to realize that it's not, you don't have to be perfect. So yeah. Dr. Munson, is he still teaching or is he, has he retired? He probably retired like what, 10 years ago or something. And <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the story he told us where he um, wanted to smuggle in some parasites to study. And so he like auto inoculated himself with that, which is disgusting. But where did he get his degree? Yeah, disgusting. Tulane School of, you know, Tropical Medicine. So, and then I went down there and I was like, yeah, this all makes sense now. <laughs> I don't know any of those life cycles anymore. <laughs> I also don't know physics, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I don't have any more questions waiting, um, but th there's one that I was sort of curious about. When did you know yeah. OB? So like, did you always know that was a specialty no. you wanted to do? No, no. I, for a while, I considered nephrology with the kidneys. So boring. Um, neurology, again, I don't know why. Um, I, I, I just, I didn't really know until I did my rotations. And it's okay if you have no idea what kind of medicine. I honestly think that makes it better because you go into it with more of an open mind. And then you'll kind of see where you track. For me, I knew that I loved procedures. Um, I knew that I loved operating, but I knew that if in the OR every day, go crazy. If I had to be in every day, I would go crazy. But I liked talking to patients in clinic. And so when I did my OB rotation and I saw that I could do a mix of labor and delivery, operate, do clinic, um, do women's health advocacy, um, policy stuff. Um, you know, I love the teenage population. I love the difference that we can make. And so all that kind of stuff, like it just, and I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie. And I just remember doing like my first emergency C-section in the middle of the night. And I was like, this is awesome. And of course the residents were like, we're so over this, but um, yeah, and just the ability to be there um, in some of the most amazing moments of a woman's life and the most sad moments, but to be able to make such a huge difference. Um, yeah, so it wasn't until my rotations. And I loved a little bit, bit of all of my rotations, except for internal medicine, because they sit there and talk for six hours on rounds. And I have more of a surgeon's mindset where I want to talk and get things done. And then I want to go operate. And I want... So you kind of track into where, um, into where I think you, um, where you're interested in. Um, but I don't think you need to know going in whatsoever. So, you know. I did just have a couple more that came in. Yeah, sure. Um, the first is, wh um, what do you do if your MCAT isn't good enough for med school? And also, how do you prepare for it? Yeah. Well, let me not advise you on how to prepare for it because I did horribly. Although I still would like to blame the motorcycle parade that went outside of our hotel room with Jen Drummond. Um, the night before MCAT and we were also in a hotel room across the street from the ice or across the hallway from the ice machine. So I'd like to blame that as the reason we did so. I did so poorly. I don't know if she did. Um, so I am not the person to ask. Um, I think in terms of preparing for the MCAT, it's all about practice questions, practice questions, practice questions. And now more than ever, that is so easy because you've got, you can take your prep course online. Um, that didn't exist in the old days. And Jen and I had to drive to, I think, Dover, Delaware, or twice a week, like an hour. And one time we almost died because we almost hit a deer. And um, I thought, well, at least we'll go, you know, doing something good. But um, so I think pra as much practice questions as you can do. Um, and then I didn't, I did terribly on my MCAT. I was like in one of the lowest percentiles. And I'm not saying you can't apply because I, I still did. And I made that, I, I addressed it head on in my essay. And I was like, you probably are wondering why I'm even applying. And here's why I'm more than that bad score. And here's the things about me that are really good. And here's what I've learned from that bad score. And here's how I'm gonna turn that into a positive. So you can call out your negatives in your application and address them because I guarantee like if you if you think it stands out it, it probably does and so go ahead and address it and I remember with my interview at Tulane with the dean um, there he's like so what's up with this and I was like I know it sucks right it's like I that was a bad day I said but look at the rest of it like this is me over four years or three years of college this is much more indicative and here's why I think I'm going to make a good doctor and he was like I feel like you've convinced me I was like thank you now let me in um, and he didn't write away, but then he did like a couple of days after the waitlist opened. Um, so I think that, you know, you can decide personally for you, if you don't think that score is good enough, then you figure out a way to make it better and you reapply versus you say, you know what, I'm just going to try, um, which is what I did. So, and it, it would have been okay if I didn't get in. I know amazing physicians who didn't get in on the first try. Sometimes in my mind, I, in my mind, I see again, Jen Drummond, she was somebody um, who I went to college with and we were applying in the same year. And we joked that they threw all the applications down the stairs and then they put sticky things over them and they just rolled down the stairs and whichever one's stuck, they're like, we'll take these people. And not to make it feel random, but sometimes it feels random. Like some of the people who are in my med school class, I was like, who let him in? You know, like he's a weirdo. Um, and they track into like pathology and radiology, but um, you know, <laughs> it was <laughs> But I mean, you can make yourself stand out. It's not that random, but it's okay if you don't get an interview somewhere or you get rejected because, you know, just because you get rejected the first time doesn't mean you can't get it the second time by any stretch of the imagination, so. The other one I have here is, do you have any stories of advocating for yourself during med school? Ooh, yeah, yeah. Um, so do you want to know the only clinical rotation that I did not, um, honor in. So it was like honors, high pass, pass, or fail. 
Um, the only one I didn't honor in was OBGYN. And I was pissed because I was like, that's my whole career, people. <laughs> Um, and so I went to the clerkship director and I was like, I need to know why I didn't honor. And not just because I like want you to just give me an honor. I need to know because I, I want to know where I fell short. I want to be able to understand and how I can do better. And it was, um, it was a practical exam. Um, and she said, Jen, it's not because of your evaluations. You know, you did great. They thought you did great. And that's what matters. That's what goes into your letters. You know, you're going to be fine. Stop trying to be perfect. But here's where you went. Here's where you did poorly on this part of the exam. And she's like, Jen, go easy on yourself. You just evacuated from a hurricane. You're wearing your mother's clothes. Like you've been here for six weeks. Like it's okay. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and again, I called that out in my residency interviews. They're like, so you want to be an OB? And this was the only one you didn't honor. And I was like, let me tell you a story about Hurricane Katrina. And we, that became a whole thing. And then, you know, I told them, I was like, listen, I, I can do the work. And so yeah, I had to, I, I, the grade didn't end up getting changed, but she's like, don't worry, I, you know, I know that you're good. Um, I'm trying to think if there were, I mean, yeah, I mean, there were times where, you know, in the OR, I would want to scrub into a case and I was told that there wasn't enough room. And I was like, I'm not that big. There's always room. And I just kind of made my way in and, um, you know, you don't want to be an idiot, but you do need to, sometimes you do need to stand up for yourself. I had one medical student who, um, again, this was in Houston, Texas. It was my neurology rotation at the VA, which is the country's biggest VA. Um, and I, again, I showed up and I was like, you know, I don't even have a stethoscope because I just got in my car and drove here from, you know, whatever flooded area. And the guy was like, yeah, so I'm planning to go into neurology. So I don't want you to mess this up for me. So I need to look good. And um, so just so you know that, because I know you, you know, we let you in here to rotate because your school is flooded, but like, this is serious for me. And I was like, oh, well, it's going to be like that. Okay. Um, and I just, you know, I just was, I just made sure that I, my voice was heard. <laughs> um, and again, that, I mean, you do, sometimes you do need to speak up. Um, the good news is I didn't see a whole lot of mistreatment or whatnot, but, um, but yeah, there were a couple. <laughs> I'm from New York too, so that was easy. So. <laughs> well, in the interest of time, since you've been so generous with us and with your time, and since we're having you back in a few weeks. Oh God, I hope you guys brain more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so next time we're talking about what it's like to be a doctor, and I just think this is important because I want you to really know what it's like. And it's not just like, it sucks. It's, you know, I'm going to tell you, things I want you to consider, but also why I think it's amazing so that we can kind of make an informed choice. So, yeah. I think I'm unfrozen, but oh, yes. Oh, no, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the flooding a little here today, but yeah. So thank you so much um, for your time tonight and for speaking with us. And uh, I can't wait to see you again in a few weeks. And so I know that others cannot wait as well. <laughs> I hope this was helpful, you guys. It was so good to see some of your faces. So, so good. You guys made my night. So, and thank you guys. And I don't know if you want to send out my email address too, because I'm always happy to um, answer questions or whatever too that people have individually. So just feel free to throw that out too. So. I will get that. Right. <laughs> send that. Thank you. Bye guys. So well, good thanks everybody. Thank Bye. We'll see y'all later virtually. Yeah. <laughs>